the exhilarations of the road. Afoot and light-hearted, I take to the open road. Walt Whitman Occasionally on the sidewalk, amid the dapper, swiftly moving high-heeled boots and gaiters, I catch a glimpse of the naked human foot. Nimbly it scuffs along, the toes spread, the sides flatten, the heel protrudes, it grasps the curbing or bends to the form of the uneven surfaces, a thing sensuous and alive. That seems to take cognizance of whatever it touches or passes. How primitive and uncivil it looks in such company, a real barbarian in the parlor. We are so unused to the human anatomy, to simple unadorned nature, that it looks a little repulsive, but it is beautiful for all that. And though it be a black foot, an unwashed foot, it shall be exalted. It is a thing of life amid leather, a free spirit amid cramped, a wild bird amid caged, an athlete amid consumptives. It is the symbol of my order, the order of walkers. That unhampered, vitally playing piece of anatomy is the type of the pedestrian man returned to first principles, in direct contact and intercourse with the earth and the elements, his faculties unsheathed, his mind plastic, his body toughened, his heart light, his soul dilated. While those cramped and distorted members in the calf and kid are the unfortunate wretches doomed to carriages and cushions. <clears throat> when I see the discomforts that able-bodied American men will put up with rather than go a mile or half, half a mile on foot, the abuses they will tolerate and, enc and encourage, crowding the streetcar on a little fall in the temperature or the appearance of an inch or two of snow packing up to overflowing, dangling to the straps, treading on each other's toes, breathing each other's breaths, crushing the women and children, hanging by tooth and nail to a square inch of the platform, imperiling their limbs and killing the horses. I think the commonest tramp in the street has a good reason to felicitate himself on his rare privilege of going afoot. Indeed, a race that neglects or despises this primitive gift, that fears the touch of the soil, that has no footpaths, no community of ownership in the land, which they imply, that warns off the walker as a trespasser, that knows no way but the highway, the carriageway, that forgets the style, the footbridge, that even ignores the rights of the pedestrian in the public road, providing no escape for him but in the ditch or up the bank, is in a fair way to far more serious degeneracy. <clears throat> Shakespeare makes the chief qualification of the walker a merry heart. Jog on, jog on, the footpath way, and merrily hent the style A merry heart goes all the day, your sad tires in a mile The human body is a steed that goes freest and longest under a light rider, and the lightest of all riders is a cheerful heart. Your sad or morose or embittered or preoccupied heart settles heavily into the saddle, and the poor beast, the body, breaks down the first mile. Indeed, the heaviest thing in the world is a heavy heart. Next to that, the most burdensome to the walker is a heart not in perfect sympathy and accord with the body, a reluctant or unwilling heart. The horse and rider must not only both be willing to go the same way, but the rider must lead the way and infuse his own lightness and eagerness into the steed. Herein is no doubt our trouble and one reason of the decay of the noble art in this country. We are unwilling walkers. We are not innocent and simple-hearted enough to enjoy a walk. We have fallen from that state of grace which capacity to enjoy a walk implies. It cannot be said that as a people we are so positively sad or morose or melancholic as that we are vacant of the sportiveness and superlage, superlage of animal spirits that characterized our ancestors and that springs from full and harmonious life. A sound heart in accord with a sound body. A man must invest himself near at hand and in common things and be content with a steady and moderate return. If he would know the blessedness of a cheerful heart and the sweetness of a walk over the round earth. This is a lesson the American has yet to learn. Capability of amusement on a low key. He expects rapid and extraordinary returns. 
he would make the very elemental laws pay usury. He has nothing to invest in a walk. It is too slow, too cheap. We crave the astonishing, the exciting, the far away, and do not know the highways of the gods when we see them, always a sign of the decay of the faith and simplicity of man. If I say to my neighbor, come with me, I have great wonders to show you, he pricks up his ears and comes forth with. But when I take him on the hills under the full blaze of the sun, or along the country road, or footsteps lighted by the moon and stars, and say to him, Behold, these are the wonders, these are the circuits of the gods. This we now tread as a morning star, he feels defrauded, and as if I had played a trick on him. And yet nothing less than the dilation, dilatation, and enthusiasm like this is the badge of the master walker. If we are not sad, we are careworn, hurried, discontented, mortgaging the present for the promise of the future. If we take a walk, it is as we take a prescription, with about the same relish and with about the same purpose, and the more and the, more the fatigue, the greater our faith in the virtue of the medicine. Of those gleesome saunters over the hills in spring, or the, those sallies of the body in winter, those excursions into space when the foot strikes fire at every step, when the air tastes like a new and finer mixture, when we accumulate force and gladness as we go along, then the sight of objects by the roadside and of the fields and woods pleases more than pictures or than all the art in the world. Those ten or twelve mile dashes that are but the wit and effluence of the corporal powers of such diversion and open road entertainment, I say, most of us know very little. I notice with astonishment that our fashionable watering places, nobody walks. That of all those vast crowds of health seekers and lovers of country air, you can never catch one in the fields or woods or guilty of trudging along the country road with dust on his shoes and suntan on his hands and face. The sole amusement seems to be to eat and dress and sit about the hotels and glare at each other. The men look bored, the women look tired, and all seem to sigh. Oh, Lord, what shall we do to be happy and not be vulgar? Quite different from our British cousins across the water who have plenty of amusement and hilarity, spending most of the time at their watering places in the open air, strolling, picnicking, boating, climbing, briskly walking, apparently with little fear of suntan or of compromising their gentility. It is indeed astonishing with what ease and hilarity the English walk. To an American it seems a kind of infatuation. When Dickens was in this country, I imagine the aspirants to the honor of a walk with him were not numerous. In a pedestrian tour of England by an American I read that after breakfast with the independent minister, he walked with us for six miles out of town upon a road. Three little boys and girls, the youngest six years old, also accompanied us. They were romping and rambling about all the while, and their morning walk must have been as much as 15 miles, but they thought nothing of it. And when we parted, we were apparently as fresh as when they started, and very loath to return. I fear also the American is becoming disqualified for the manly art of walking by falling off in the size of his foot. He cherishes and cultivates this part of his anatomy and apparently thinks his taste and good breeding are to be inferred from its diminutive size. A small trim foot, well booted or gaitered, is the national vanity. How we stare at the big feet of foreigners and wonder what may be the price of leather in those countries and where all the aristocratic blood is that these plebeian extremities so predominate. If we were admitted to the confidence of the shoemaker to Her Majesty or to, the, to His Royal Highness, no doubt we should modify our views upon this latter point, for a truly large and royal nature is never stunted in the extremities. A little foot never yet supported a great character. It is said that Englishmen, when they first come to this country, are for some time under the impression that American women all have deformed feet, they are so coy of them and so studiously careful to keep them hid that there is an astonishing difference between the women of the two countries in this respect every traveler can testify and that there is a difference equally astonishing between the pedestrian habits and capabilities of the rival sisters is also certain. 
The English pedestrian no doubt has the advantage of us in this matter in the matter of climate, for notwithstanding the traditional gloom and moroseness of English skies they have in that country, none of those relaxing, sinking, enervating days of which we have so many here, and which seem especially trying to the female constitution, days which withdraw all support from the back and loins, and render walking of all things burdensome. Theirs is a climate of which it has been said that it invites men abroad more days in the year and more hours in the day than that of any other country. Then their land is threaded with paths which invite the walker, and which are scarcely less important than the highways. I hear of a salt surly nobleman near London who took it into his head to close a footpath that passed through his estate near his house and open another a little farther off. The pedestrians objected. The matter got into the courts and after protracted litigation, the aristocrat was beaten. The path could not be closed or moved. The memory of man ran not to the time when there was not a footpath there, and every pedestrian should have the right of way where of there still. I remember the pleasure I had in the path that connects Stratford-on-Avon with Shottery, Shakespeare's path when he went courting Anne Hathaway. By the King's Highway, the distance is some farther, so there is a well-worn path along the hedgerows and through the meadows and turn-up patches. The traveller in it has the privilege of crossing the railroad track, an unusual privilege in England, and one denied to the lord in his carriage who must either go over it or under it. It is a privilege, is it not, to be allowed the forbidden, even if it be the privilege of being run over by the engine? In strolling over the the South Downs, too, I was delighted to find that where the hill was steepest, some benefactor of the Order of Walkers had made notches in the sward so that the foot could bite the better and firmer. The path become, became a kind of stairway which I have no doubt the plowman respected. When you see an English country church, withdrawn, secluded, out of the reach of wheels, standing amid grassy graves and surrounded by noble trees, approached by paths and shaded lanes, you appreciate more than ever this beautiful habit of the people. Only a race that knows how to use its feet and hold it and holds footpaths sacred could put such a charm of privacy and humility into such a structure. I think I should be tempted to go to church myself if I saw all my neighbors starting off across the fields or along paths that led to such charmed spots. And we're sure I should not be jostled or run over by the rival chariots of the worshippers of the temple doors. I think that is where what ails our religion. Humility and devoutness of heart leave one when he lays by his walking shoes and walking clothes and sets out for church drawn by something. Indeed, I think it would be a tantamount to an astonishing revival of religion if the people would all walk to church on Sunday and walk home again. Think how the stones would preach to them by the wayside, how their benumbed minds would warm up beneath the friction of the gravel, how their vain and foolish thoughts, their desponding thoughts, their besetting demons of one kind and another would drop behind them, unable to keep up or to endure the fresh air. They would walk away from their innu, their worldly cares, their uncharitableness, their pride of dress, for these devils always want to ride. While the simple virtues are never so happy as when on foot, let us walk by all means, but if we will ride, get an ass. Then the English claim that they are a more hardy and robust people than we are. It is certain they are a plainer people, have plainer taste, dress plainer, build plainer, speak plainer, keep close to facts, wear broader shoes and coarser clothes, and place a low estimate on themselves, all of which traits favor pedestrian habits. The English grandee is not confined to his carriage, but if the American aristocrat leaves his, he is ruined. Oh, the weariness, the emptiness, the plodding, the seeking rest and finding none that go by in the carriages, while your pedestrian is always cheerful, alert, and refreshed with his heart in his hand, and his hand free to all. He looks down upon nobody. He is on the common level. His pores are all open, his circulation is active, his digestion good. His heart is not cold, nor are his faculties asleep. 
He is the only real traveler. He alone tastes the gay, fresh sentiment of the road. He is not isolated, but is at one with things, with the farms and the industries on, each ha on either hand. The vital, universal currents play through him. He knows the ground is alive. He feels the pulses of the wind and reads the mute language of things. His sympathies are all, are all aroused. His senses are continually reporting messages to his mind. Wind, frost, rain, heat, cold are something to him. He is not merely a spectator of the panorama of nature, but a participator in it. He experiences the country he passes through, tastes it, feels it, absorbs it. The traveler in the fine carriages sees it merely. This gives the fresh charm to that class of books that may be called views afoot and to the narratives of hunters, naturalists, exploring parties, etc. The walker does not need a large territory. When you get into a railway car, you want a continent. The man in his carriage requires a township, but a walker like Thoreau finds much and mu as much and, mu and more along the shores of Walden Pond. The former, as it were, has merely time to glance at the headings of the chapters, while the latter need not miss a line, and Thoreau reads between the lines. Then the walker has the privilege of the fields, the woods, the hills, the byways. The apples by the roadside are for him, and the berries and the spring of water, and the friendly shelter, and if the weather is cold, he eats the frost grapes and the persimmons, or even the white meated turnip snatched from the field he passed through with incredible relish. Afoot and in the open road, one has a fair start in life at last. There is no hindrance now. Let him put his best foot forward. He is on the broadest human plane. This is on the level of all the great laws and heroic deeds. From this platform he is eligible to any good fortune. He was sighing for the golden age. Let him walk to it. Every step brings him nearer. The youth of the world is but a few days' journey distant. Indeed, I know persons who think that they have walked back to that fresh aforetime of a single bright Sunday in autumn or early spring. Before noon they felt its airs upon their cheeks, and by nightfall on the banks of some quiet stream or along some path in the wood or on some hilltop, a veer they heard have heard the voices and felt the wonder and the mystery that so enchanted the early races of men. I think if I could walk through a country, I should not only see many things and many adventures that I should otherwise miss, but that I should come into relations with that country at first hand and with the men and women in it, in a way that would afford the deepest satisfaction. Hence, I envy the good fortune of all walkers and feel like joining myself to every tramp that comes along. I am jealous of the clergyman I read about the other day who footed it from Edinburgh to London, as poor Effie Deans did, carrying her shoes in her hand most of the way and over the ground that rugged Ben Johnson strode, larking it to Scotland so long ago. I read with longing of the pedestrian feats of college youths, so gay and light-hearted with their coarse shoes on their feet and their knapsacks on their backs. It would have been a good draught of the rugged cup to have walked with Wilson, the ornithologist, deserted by his companions from Niagara to Philadelphia through the snows of winter. I almost wished that I had been born to the career of a German mechanic, that I might have had that delicious adventures, adventurous year of wandering over my country before I settled down to work. I think how much richer and firmer grain life would be to me if I could journey afoot through Florida and Texas, or follow the windings of the Platte or the Yellowstone, or stroll through Oregon, or browse for a season about Canada. In the bright, inspiring days of autumn, I only want the time and the companion to walk back to the natal spot, the family nest across two states and into the mountains of a third. What adventures would have been by the way? What hard pulls, what prospects from hills, what spectacles would behold of night and day, what passages with dogs, what glances, what peeps into windows, what characters we should fall in with, and how seasoned and hardy we should arrive at our destination. For companion, I, would, I should want a veteran of the war. Those marches put something into him I like. Even at this distance, his metal is but little softened. As soon as he gets warmed up, it all comes back to him. 
He catches your step and away you go, a gay, adventurous, half-predatory couple. How quickly he falls into the old ways of jest and anecdote and song. You have may, you may have known him for years without having heard him hum an air, or more than casually revert to the subject of his experience during the war. You have even questioned and cross-questioned <clears throat> without firing the train you wish, but get him out on a vacation tramp and you can walk it all the way out of him. By the campfire at night or swinging along the streams by day, song, anecdote, adventure come to the surface and you wonder how your companion has kept silent so long. It is another proof of how walking brings out the true character of a man. The devil never yet asked his victims to take a walk with him. You will not be long in finding your companion out. All disguises will fall away from him. As his pores open, his character is laid bare. His deepest and most private self will come to the top. It matters little with whom you ride so he be not a pickpocket, for both of you will very likely settle down closer and firmer in your reserve, shaken down like a measure of corn by the jolting as the journey proceeds. But walking is a more vital co-partnership. The relation is a closer and more sympathetic one, and you do not feel like walking ten paces with a stranger without speaking to him. Hence the fastidiousness of the professional walker in choosing or admitting a companion, and hence the truth of a remark of Emerson that you will generally fare better to take your dog than to invite your neighbor. Your cur dog is a true pedestrian, and your neighbor is very likely a small politician. The dog enters thoroughly into the spirit of the enterprise. He is not indifferent or preoccupied. He is constantly sniffing adventure, laps at every spring, looks upon every field and wood as a new world to be explored, is ever on some fresh trail, knows something important will happen a little farther on, gazes with the true wonder seeing eyes, whatever the spot or whatever the road finds, it good to be there. In short, is just that happy, delicious, excursive, vagabond that touches one at so many points and whose human prototype in a companion robs miles and leagues of half their power to fatigue. Persons who find themselves spent in a short walk to the market or the post office or to do a little shopping wonder how it is that the pedestrian friends can com compass so many weary miles and not fall down from sheer exhaustion. Ignorant of the fact that the walker is a kind of projectile that drops far or near according to the expansive force of the motive that set it in motion, and that it is easy enough to regulate the charge according to the distance to be traversed. If I am loaded to carry only one mile and am compelled to walk three, I generally feel more fatigued than if I had walked six under the proper impulse of pre-adjusted resolution. In other words, the will or corporal mainspring, whatever it be, is capable of being wound up to different degrees of tension so that one may walk all day nearly as easy as half the time. If he is prepared beforehand, he knows his task and he mowers accordingly. It is for this reason that an unknown road is always a long road. We cannot cast the mental eye along it and see the end from the beginning. We are fighting in the dark and cannot take the measure of our foe. Every step must be preordained and provided for in the mind. Hence also the fact that to vanquish one mile in the woods seems equally to compass, compassing three in the open country. The furlongs are ambushed and we magnify them. Then again, how annoying to be told it is only five miles to the next place when it is really eight or ten. We fall short nearly half the distance and are compelled to urge and roll the spent ball the rest of the way. In such a case, walking degenerates from a fine art to a mechanic art. We walk merely to get over the ground becomes the one serious and engrossing thought, whereas success in walking is not to let your right foot know what your left foot doeth. Your heart must furnish such music that in keeping time to it, your feet will carry you around the globe without you knowing it. The walker, I would describe, takes no note of distance. His walk is a sally, a bon mot, an unspoken jet d'esprit. The ground is his butt, his provocation. It furnishes, furnishes him the resistance his body craves. He rebounds upon it. He glances off and returns again and uses it gaily as his tool. 
I do not think that I exaggerate the importance or the charms of a pedestrianism or our need as people to cultivate the art. I think it would tend to soften the national manners to teach us the meaning of leisure, to acquaint us with the charms of the open air, to strengthen and foster the ties between the race and the land. No one else looks out upon the world so kindly and charitably as the pedestrian. No one gives and takes so much from the country he passes through. Next to the laborer in the fields, the walker holds the cr closest relation to the soil, and he holds a closer and more vital relation to nature because he is freer and his mind more at leisure. Man takes root at his feet, and at best he is no more than a plotted plant in his house or carriage till he has established communication with the soil by the, the loving and magnetic touch of his souls to it. Then the tie of association is born, then spring those invisible fibers and rootlets through which character comes to smack of the soil and which make a man kindred to the spot of earth he inhabits. The roads and paths you have walked along in summer and winter, winter weather, the fields and hills which you have looked upon in lightness and gladness of heart, where fresh thoughts have come into your mind or some noble prospect has opened before you and especially the quiet ways where you have walked in sweet converse with your friend, pausing under the trees, drinking at the spring, Henceforth they are not the same. A new charm is added. Those thoughts spring there perennial. Your friend walks there forever. We have produced some good walkers and saunterers and some noted climbers, but as a staple recreation, as a daily practice, the mass of the people dislike and despise walking. Thoreau said he, he was a good horse but a poor roadster. I chant the virtues of the roadster as well. I sing of the sweetness of gravel, good sharp quartz grit. It is the proper condiment for the sterner seasons, and many a human gizzard would be cured of half its ills by a suitable daily allowance of it. I think Thoreau himself would have profited immensely by it. His diet was too exclusively vegetable. A man cannot live on grass alone. If one has been a lotus eater all summer, he must turn gravel eater in the fall and winter. Those who have tried it know that gravel possesses an equal, though an opposite, charm. It spurs to action, the foot tastes it, and henceforth rests not. The joy of moving and surmounting, of attrition and progression, the thirst for space, for miles and leagues of distance, for sights and prospects to, to cross mountains and thread rivers, and defy frost, heat, snow, danger, difficulties, seizes it, and from that day forth its possessor is enrolled in the noble army of walkers.'